All right, everybody, it's Friday. Kyle and I are hitting the road on our Locked On summer road trip, and it brings us to Minnesota to talk with our good friend, Mr. Seth Topol from Locked On Wild. A lot to get to with these two franchises, as always. Let's get to it. Your Locked On Avalanche, your daily podcast on the Colorado Avalanche. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, everybody, welcome to the Locked On Avalanche podcast and the Locked On Minnesota Wild podcast. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for tuning in and making it your first listen of the day. Always appreciated. I am Chris Maselli. With me, as always, Mr. Shaggy Von Doom from the Locked On Avalanche podcast. And as I stated in the beginning, from the Locked On Wild show, we have Mr. Seth Topol once again with a crossover. How's the offseason going so far for you, sir? Going well, uh, just starting to gear up for the 2023-2024 uh, season and uh, mm. passing the time with a little Lockdown Wild boot camp here over the next couple of months. I so, saw you promoting that. I like it. fun with it. Just trying, <laughs> like to, it. just trying to leave no stone unturned yeah. as we uh, gear up for the season. So there's plenty nice. of angles to discuss. And well, I, I want to start quickly with, because uh, I know there's probably some Avalanche fans and probably even some Wild fans going, oh, God, we got to listen to the Avalanche guys. and Or, oh, man, why are they doing a crossover with the Wild guy again? Uh, but I, I have to start here because you host, is it the Tuesday episode of Lockdown NHL? And on this most recent episode... You, uh, you and your who's your co host there? I forgot his name, uh, Nick Morgan Nick. of Locked On Preds Predators, right? Um, you guys did, and this is so interesting to me, you guys did the top 10 coaches in the West, and he put Jared Bednar at four. You, Mr. Seth Topol, put Jared Bednar at number two, and you only put him behind, um, uh, what's his name from, from Vegas, uh, Bruce Cassidy. Cassidy. Yeah. And I completely understand that. If you want to put the the guy who won the the Stanley Cup in number one, I don't have a problem with that. But I love how the Minnesota Wild guy put him at number two, and the Preds guy put him at four. I thought that was great. So uh, I I want to give you a thank you for that, sir. I appreciate that. I am always willing to acknowledge greatness, and as I have done throughout the off season and gearing up for this season as well. Abs are going to be one of those. Uh, very difficult squads to deal with in the central and the West as well. And so you know, we're, if we're ranking coaches, even with recency bias, Bednar has got to be up at the top of the list. And so if you want to crown Bruce Cassidy as top, because they just won the cup, that's kind of the route that I took, but mm -hmm. let's keep in mind who won the cup the season before that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or it's, it could be your coy way of just saying the avalanche are number two. <laughs> oh, is that? <laughs> uh, do we? Ooh, did oh, did Kyle see through your your deceiving ways? <laughs> ooh, okay, but still, hey, I, we can't argue that. I like it. I like it. So, um, I, there, there's always things to get into with, with these two teams. We'll 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 talk about you know we've been doing these uh, crossovers every Friday, um, kind of just gauging your thoughts and and kind of like the fan base's thoughts on how things have been going for the wild this off season when it comes to, we'll get to the draft next, but you know, we'll focus on uh, free agents, unrestricted, who they kept, who they brought in um, a pretty crazy off season for the wild, even though it hasn't been busy, but there's kind of reasons as to why, as you were kind of uh, telling us before we hit the record button here. Well, the overall plan for this offseason was going to be keep the guys that you can afford to keep. And beyond that, there just was not going to be a lot that was going on because the Wild are still holding serve to maneuver past the dead cap hits of Zach Parisi and Ryan Suter. Because had they kept both guys, it, it probably wouldn't as have been as much of an issue with Ryan Suter because he's still he's still performing at a at a reasonable level with Dallas. So there's no there's no issue uh, of him potentially retiring before that deal is done. Mm -hmm. Zach Parisi, however, is a free agent right now, and there is really only one team 
that is even remotely interested in his services, that of course being the Islanders. So there's a pretty good chance that he may retire. And so what would that have meant then? So if that were the case, Gary Bettman's beautifully orchestrated cap recapture penalties that happened after those contracts were signed would have cost the wild $9 million last year. Had he retired after the season, if he were to retire this year and still be on the wild roster, or even if he would have been traded, that's 19, one, nine, $19 million that it would have cost the wild if you retired early. So even if they kept one and not the other, it still costs them more than it did uh, to buy them both buy out. Them. So why, why, Explain that whole thing to me. Like, what what is that recapture thing? Like, I don't, because it doesn't seem like you see it all that much um, no. in the NHL. So, so what is the logistics of it? How, how does all that break down? So essentially, it was put in as a measure to prevent teams from like taking a thirteen year deal and trying to, okay. you know, stack it up front, move gotcha. everything to the back, so that you can kind of maneuver the cap in ways that you, that the NHL wouldn't want you to do. So rather than just say, okay, from here on, these fail safes are going to be put in for contracts so that we don't have this happening. They were like, nope, these two contracts definitely count for this too. And so they take a percentage of the money that you earn over the course of the, uh, of the contracts. And they just add that on for every season that, uh, that you don't finish the deal. So wow. even if you retire, yeah. if you retire, yeah. that's crazy. That is now wild. with, with this anticipation of whatever is going to happen with these buyouts and that money that could be coming off, how much has that affected how you approach the off season? Because let's be honest, there was not a lot of big names floating around. And it's it's kind of not what the Minnesota Wild do. They're not really the landing spot for the big names that are out there. When you had these big name free agents and the guys that are their deals are up, it's Minnesota's never at the top of the list for a landing spot. What does mm-hmm. how did that change anything in your offseason? I know you got flowering net. I understand that's one of the the big names out there, but it's what do you do when it comes to signing deals? Because you have a very young team. An yeah. extremely young team but is that good enough because for for the minnesota wild going into next year well that's that's why these next two years are going to be so important because this is a franchise that has received rave reviews about their prospect pool and so you want to over this season and next season see what you have figure out okay we have players that can play at all of these spots so that once you come out of these these dead cap hits, it goes from fourteen point seven million dollars in dead cap money. Two years from now, it'll be one point six million. It'll hmm. truly just be those buyouts. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And so the goal is going to be over these next couple of seasons to say, okay, we've got prospects that can fill this spot, this spot, this spot, so that when that money is available, Bill Guerin can say, okay, here's what we need, or if there are players. There will be a few that will need new deals. Karel Kaprizov. (laughs) So it's going to be money to help keep those guys around. And yeah, it probably isn't going to be one of those guys that makes somewhere around nine or $10 million because yeah, it's Minnesota is a spot that as evident by those two deals has to do a little more to pull people in. And there was the Minnesota tie with, uh, with Ryan Suter, at least um, with that deal. So it's going to be a situation of having money to spend, just needing to know where to spend it and you know, going out and getting a guy that's maybe making five or six million dollars a year to plug into a spot. Mm-hmm. So it's just the phrase that I've used is knowing what you have so you know what you need once these buyouts are are finished, which will it just can never be soon enough. Yeah, right. I mean, it must it must feel uh, like like double the years that it's actually going on for uh, for you guys. But I don't know, Kyle. Like you said, I, I kind of feel like Minnesota is a place where pe- like players would want to go. I mean, it's a great hockey state. 
Um, but I kind of feel like it, it, it's it's if the Minnesota Wild front office wants to kind of put an effort uh, to bring guys in, they can bring guys in. And this year, I think it may be they're a little bit hamstrung. Uh, so it was tough to do that. Right. So it, it wasn't like they could just go out and, and do kind of like make some not like some big splashes or stuff like that, but um, really go and, and kind of maybe plug up some holes here and there. They did, but nothing that really moved the needle. But as far as who they did bring in, you happy with it? Or is it like, is the best we could do? Considering the parameters that they had to operate with, I I was fine with it. It wasn't going to ever be an off season of going and getting like a Ryan O'Reilly or anybody like that. It's keeping a guy like Brandon Duhame, who I really like. I like him. bring some nice physicality while not being as big as some players that we've had that just haven't been able to do that. Like Jordan Greenway in particular. Uh, so keeping him around, getting a new deal with Philip Gustafson, who is going to be kind of that bridge starter. Mark Andre Fleury is likely done after this season. Yeah. Yes. For Volstead is working his way through the minors at this point. So having Gustafson locked in so that he can be the starter this year, he can be the starter next year. And then at that point, Volstead's ready to go, then you have a trade chip that you can throw at something else as well. So getting those guys signed, I did like the Pat Maroon acquisition because um, Ryan Reeves, I just, he was a presence, yes, but that that's about it. And I feel like Maroon at least will use a little more of his physicality. And I mean, the guy has won multiple cups. So that's going to be able to help as well for a locker room that has captains and alternate captains that aren't as vocal as with other teams. So I think that's going to help as well. And so it was always going to be a pretty quiet off season. Right. Um, so I, I was fine with it. It's, it's more so just, I'm happy that he's not that Bill Guerin isn't really trying to overextend okay. a lot of the deals that he has put together for this team line up with those buyouts dropping. So once they hit 2025, 2026, the, the guys that are signed on this team are the guys that you want long-term Kirill, Matt Boldy, Jewel Erickson, you've got Spurgeon and Brodeen. So it's pretty much a bare cupboard right now at that point. And so they're going to have a ton of money to work with. Um, and so I, I just would rather over these next couple of years that that's the route they go. Okay. All right. Um, well, let's uh, get our first break in here and then we'll uh, kind of talk about where they went through the draft. And, and you know, uh, Kyle said, you know, you guys are a young team kind of dipping into that prospect pool, uh, what to expect there. But first, we're going to hear from FanDuel, and you can take your first swing at betting Major League Baseball on FanDuel, and you can get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. You can bet $20, and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, and you get that win or lose. And that's $200 you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run to the how are the Minnesota Twins doing this year Seth I haven't really kept up with baseball uh they are yeah. currently leading the central division but go. they would be <laughs> like the 10th team out of however many make the playoffs so not great a little bit of fool's gold there maybe yeah. all right uh and you can do this all on an app that's safe secure and super easy to use plus when you win you get paid instantly there's no better place to bet in major league baseball than FanDuel America's number one sports book so sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. Once again, FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel is the official partner of Major League Baseball. Uh, real quick, you mentioned uh, Kirill Kaprizov. He's got uh, how many years left on that on that deal? He's got three yeah. more years. Okay. What, what's, the, what's the number looking like for, for the next one? I gotta saying? feel like I gotta feel like he's gonna be between. I'll say I'll say he'll be around eleven. Um, I, I just so. I feel like that's just for whatever reason that number just keeps yeah. getting in the head. I, I think he's you know three years from now that that's gonna benefit him with that cap. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, he might be a little a couple million more than that. 
we'll, well see. And that's, and we'll that's, see. that's, that's the part of it too, is that as the wilds continue to cultivate this roster with $14 million that they can't use, Bill Guerin has done a good job of, of putting this team together. I mean, they've, they've been a 100 point team the last two years Yeah, man. and you get to the postseason, and it's like, <laughs> boy, that money would be great to try <laughs> win a series. And yeah. so they, they've made pretty clear that whatever Kirill wants, he's probably going to get in his next deal. So I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if it's North of 11. Yeah. And I feel like whatever the number is, they're going to be comfortable paying it because he's the best player in franchise history right now. And he's only going to wow. continue to uh, to further that as he goes. Okay. All right. Um, let's get to their draft. And they had uh, with their number one pick, Charlie Strammel. I think that's a good pick. So, tall, big dude. Um, and, and, you know, plays the center position. Um, with the, They had two second round picks. Yeah. Yep. And you're going to have to help me with Rasmus's last name. Kumpalainen. Uh. Koopa, 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 Koopa Lainen, I think it is. Koopa Oompa Loopa, maybe? I don't yeah, know. I, exactly. I think I tried to make like a complaining um, yeah. metaphor with it. Right. And then I think a really good value pick with their second uh, pick in the second round at 64, the Riley, um, excuse me. Yeah, Riley Height, who, and this was kind of like I talked about this draft over and over again. This draft was so deep. I saw mocks with him in the teens. Mm hmm. And he went, what was it 64 uh, in the you know second round? So, you know, and then you didn't pick till the fifth. So we'll kind of focus on those three guys. Happy with them? Where do you see? What's the projections for them in terms of when, when they're going to make it to the big show? So the Strammel pick just surprised me a little bit, which is why my reaction on draft night was as pointed as it was, because he just wasn't somebody that I had. Mm-hmm in that general area. But the more research I did on it, as you alluded to, he's a big physical kid. He graded well, as was pointed out uh, in draft coverage, he graded fantastically well in a bunch of different skill areas at the combine. Great face-off guy. And this is a team that just up the middle does not have a ton of size. Hmm. They've got Jewel Erickson Eck, who is bigger, but beyond that, you got Ryan Hartman, you've got Freddie Goudreau, you're going to have Marco Rossi as part of that mix at some point. He is not uh, a bigger center himself. So Bill Guerin went out and they they got a bigger center that went through just a hideously bad season at Wisconsin. His freshman year, they were just they were atrocious hmm. and players were in and out. Now they get Mike Hastings as head coach, the former um, Minnesota Mankato head coach who is really good at developing players. So the hope is that he's going to be able to kind of get back on track. Also dealt with some uh, personal tragedy as well um, earlier in his life. So he's been through a lot at this stage in his life. Mm -hmm. But I think the Wild look at that as somebody that has been able to meet all those challenges and just continues to uh, continues to play and continues to get it done which is something that they really like. So I, I like the pick now in, in having a chance to, uh, to digest it and react to it. The Riley Hyde pick is my favorite. Mm -hmm. He was somebody that I was pounding my desk for with their first pick in the second round. And I thought, well, there's no way that he's going to be there by the time they come back around. Yeah. Cause what was the difference between 53 to so 11 picks? So yeah, that's sizable. Yeah. And he, he, <laughs> pegged as you as you alluded to as a guy who could have been drafted in the first round so i would have it depends on the order you can flip it however you want but ultimately the wild got two guys that at least at some point were projected in the first round yeah so i think you got to feel pretty good about uh, being able to add those types of players to the prospect pool in just one draft <clears throat> and you mentioned going into this segment about the wild hitting a hundred points and you know, the lack of success in the playoffs. <clears throat> and you mentioned the buyouts in the first segment, talking about how that's kind of overhanging going into this draft. What is the likelihood? Because you know how deep Iowa is, you know, how deep and young Minnesota is right now with these two draft picks. Do you, what is the likelihood they show up as a member of the Minnesota wild? Are these potential trade pieces 
And it was that the knowledge going in that these are going to be trade pieces to get us through until these buyouts kind of fall out. Is this a um, kind of package to get you to that point where you can actually start really paying the players you need and putting this team together? It's an interesting question. Um, I would say Strammel probably has the better chance to make it to this team just because he's a hometown kid. The Wilds value that with uh, with a lot of their draft picks. And they're willing to wait longer for him to develop. Uh, probably going to spend uh, a couple of years at school, maybe one for sure. And so I think they're a little more comfortable with him taking a longer route to get to the NHL level. As far as height goes, and as far as any of the other prospects in the system go, the one thing that Bill Guerin has shown throughout his tenure is he's not shy about making moves if he feels like it benefits the team. And I like the fact that he comes in with an outside perspective because if you have somebody that's been in the organization forever, as was the case with Chuck Fletcher, they tend to overvalue those guys that are in the system and say, well, we can plug every hole we have on the roster with some of these guys. And Bill Guerin has come in and he said, hey, if we have something that we need, we're going to go get it. And so I-, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some of these prospects dealt at some point within the next couple of seasons because. There aren't going to be a ton. Uh, I did look at some free agents, potential free agents in 2025, 2026. And I will say uh, in my defense, I don't think there is a likelihood that a particular avalanche impending free agent actually leaves the team. You were playing with fire on social media there, my friend. (laughs) I just felt like putting that picture up because I knew it would get a reaction. (laughs) It was very, very well played. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about the the expectations for for this year because you got to give the Wild some credit here. Like you said, yeah, hitting hundred uh, point mark the past couple seasons with everything that is being dealt to them. Um, so they're kind of like yeah, playing for the future when they can get beyond those contracts while still holding their own. Like it's it's kind of impressive to see really what they're doing, and they're in the mix. They're making the playoffs. And then that's a whole nother discussion. But uh, is it more of the same for, for this year? I mean, I, I can't expect you would think like, hey, we, we probably should, you know, uh, I don't feel like you have the mindset of like, oh, we're not going to be as good as last year. We w- won't take a step back. Um, and then and having said that, you could probably say like, well, we can try to, to take a step forward. But you have to do that really kind of methodically because of all, all the, you know, the cap situation goes for everybody. But it's just a different thing for the wild than any any other team so what is the expectations just more of more of the same really you know it's funny because off of losing to dallas and going into the offseason my mindset was i think this is finally the year that things start to kind of nosedive a little bit and it just becomes too much for this team to overcome to be able to be one of those top three in the division and you know i i had initially said, I think they'll be fighting for a wild card spot to the end of the season. Whether they get it is just dependent on how things play out throughout the year. But as I look at it more, this was an offense in five on five that was one of the worst in the NHL. Really, The offense cratered this season. And so my thinking has kind of changed to they're really – it, it, it's going to be hard for the offense to be that bad again. Like it was propped up by power play goals, by shorthanded goals, by great goaltending. And so you would assume, okay, goaltending is probably going to regress a little bit because Philip Gustafson had, you know, he was a top three goalie statistically in the NHL. There's no way he does that again. Well, if he even is in, if he even drops back to somewhere in the top 10, He's still a good goalie in in the NHL, and you would assume that if the offense is better, that they can kind of meet in the middle a little bit to where if you're mm-hmm. giving up more goals, you're also scoring more goals, and uh, and that just kind of evens out. We also get to see a full season of the Matt Boldy, Jewel Eriksson Ek, Marcus Johansson line, which was fantastic until Jewel Eriksson Ek got hurt. 
Big key there is Marcus Johansson, if he can stay healthy because he has had injury issues throughout his entire career. If he can stay healthy, that top six is going to be pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I don't really have a whole ton of faith in the Winnipeg Jets, as many have said, hey, watch out for Winnipeg this year. I just don't see it. And so you've got Dallas and Colorado at the top of the division. Then you got a space. I put the wild right there. And then a little bit of a space between them and Winnipeg, St. Louis, and Nashville. That's kind of how I see things playing out in the Central. So now I'm like, well, why can't they be one of those top three again? Yeah. Yeah, it's not the strongest of divisions. Like I mean, you said, like it's the, the Avs and, and Dallas. And then there is that kind of like mixture in the middle. And then you have, you know, the two bottom guys with uh, Chicago and Arizona. Um, and, and that's kind of just how it is right now. As far as, far as um, you know, players... What's going on with Ross? Is, is is Marco Rossi? Is he is he is he the one who's like got the long COVID, or am I thinking of somebody else? Is he had he had the myo, mitocarditis that basically took him out of hockey for a full full year uh, after he got COVID. So working his way through that, he it was a rough start to the year for him last year. He played in uh, I believe it was nineteen games at one point. But I'm going to be real honest. Yeah, he was put in like a fourth line role or a third line role with guys that really don't have a ton of offensive ability. And so he wasn't performing up to the level that the team had hoped, but the team didn't put him in a position to succeed themselves. He went down to Iowa. He, he was really good again down there. I would love to see him get an opportunity in the top six this year, just to see if he can do it. Because again, back to the theme, you got to know what you have. So you know what you need you got to figure out if he is going to be somebody that can stick in that top six. And if not, then you find somebody else that can fill that role. Ryan Hartman's the one C right now, but he's going to be a free agent. And I don't necessarily view him as a long-term fit there. So you got to figure out somebody that can, can center that line with Kaprizov and Zuccarello for this year. Um, I would love to see him get the opportunity. You have Hartman to fall back on if it doesn't work, but you just, you got to see what you have there. He's, he's done great in Iowa the last two years. At some point, there's really nothing that you can do at the AHL level, nothing additional you can do. And then it just becomes time to just try to figure it out at the NHL level. Yeah. I'm I'm curious and I'm perplexed as a Minnesota Wild fan. You just saw everybody witness who just won the Stanley Cup, a, a fairly new expansion team. You've seen Seattle hit the league running, and they're continually getting better. You've seen expansion Vegas. team peers. <laughs> yeah, you saw the peers in the Nashville Predators come close. And where does the the state of hockey, Minnesota? what if you keep mentioning see what you got what if it's not enough because the first and second round exits it's been the consistent theme where does minnesota finally make that push to that next level to a contender is do you think where you have and the pieces that you're looking at to see if you have enough could you find that this year with a top heavy like dallas and colorado as you mentioned do you think you can find that in this upcoming season? And if you don't, what do you do? Well, this is where those uh, buyouts become such an issue. And this was the problem for Bill Guerin when he took over is that this was always going to be a problem because even if, even if Parisi and Suter were model citizens, again, their contracts taking up a ton of money and you're you're staring right down the possibility of of Parisi retiring and so some um just I guess I would say contract malpractice by Chuck Fletcher uh and it was a prospect pool that was pretty empty when he took over and so it kind of coincided perfectly in that yeah we're going to be hamstrung with these buyouts but that gives us an opportunity it's a wild team as well, and I was I was floored to learn this. They have had the most or second most first-round picks 
over the last handful of seasons. Bill Guerin's trying to restock that that cupboard so that he can fill these spots. But this isn't going to be a contention window for this wild team until those buyouts are gone. And so at this point, they're just playing with house money. Mm -hmm. If they would have, like, let's say, for instance, they would have beaten Dallas in the first round. It's likely that it's not going to go any further than that because it's just that that money that they can't use is just too tall of an obstacle for them to overcome. And so everything that they do, every signing, every draft, every trade is all geared towards 2025, 2026, when they have pretty much the full complement of money to work with. And then they will be able to truly say, okay, we've got a team that we feel like we can have contend for a Stanley cup because we can fill all those needs that we have with all the money that we haven't been able to use over the last few years. Wow. That's, that's pretty interesting. And and then at that point in time, that's when you're expecting Chicago to maybe step it up yeah. a little bit and who knows what's going to go on with Arizona, but uh, you know, th- that really could be the time when this division starts to get a little bit more tighter between like one and six. So, and that's, that's why too, I have, um, I've kind of also guarded against that as well, because there hasn't been a ton of criticism of Dean Evison, who yes, has been the architect of some really, really good regular seasons, but you get to the postseason, lack of adjustments, complaints about officiating, which is something that you yourself can control. (laughs) And so I've been saying the last couple of seasons that it's all well and good to say, well, we can't put our full team out there until these buyouts are done. That's fine. If you want to, if you want to go into that being the reason, but that's only going to be something you can say for two more seasons. Then after that, if you have a coach that doesn't adjust in a postseason series, there is nothing to hide behind. And so at that point, then that's where the accountability comes back because You've got the full complement of the cap. If you're putting a team together that's not getting it done. Hmm. It's a team to watch. Definitely going forward. It's going to be fun to watch them navigate. Interestingly enough, the first time these two guys play against each other this year, Black Friday. And we all know that American Thanksgiving and that crazy stat of like, if you're in a playoff spot by American Thanksgiving, like 75% of the time you make the playoffs. We'll see where uh, these two teams, the Avalanche and Wild, are uh, the first time that they meet up. Pretty crazy. So Yeah, and it's I, I'm so glad that the Wild have a favorable schedule this year. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Uh, all right, man. So, uh, yeah, that'll wrap it up for today. Why don't you shout out where uh, everybody can follow you in the show? Yeah, you can follow me on X at Seth, T-O-U-P-S. <laughs> you can also follow the show account at Lockdown Wild. Follow us on any of your uh, favorite podcast platforms to enjoy what we have uh, coming at you for Lockdown Wild Boot Camp, as well as any other Minnesota Wild-related news and notes. We've got you covered. Love it. All right, man. Well, uh, definitely we'll check in during the season. I'm sure we'll have another one of these uh, in the hopper at some point during the year so it would be my pleasure love it love it thanks for uh tuning in everybody making it your first listen of the day always appreciated for mr shaggy von doom and myself we are the hosts of locked on avalanche for mr seth topol from locked on wild thanks for tuning in everyone and enjoy the weekend we'll see you guys on monday